of Los Angeles County. It's about 30 miles from the center of the city, right out by the beaches of Malibu, just over the mountains. It has farmland, it has a place for all of your new age ideas of solar energy and organic gardening and new age family. It's a coming together of concentrated light and energy and purpose. Our Montessori school is to bring children to their inner genius, their inner potential, to send them forth into the world as leaders, as statesmen. It's just one of those places that becomes the springboard for the coming revolution in higher consciousness. So when we realize, as we meditate upon the child, that here is the potential of life itself, of the fullness of that which God has given to his servant sons. In our teaching and our path, we realize that souls are part of the moving stream of God's consciousness, that we have all lived before and are on a mighty pathway of life. We realize then that the three-year-old may have vast attainment in previous lifetimes that we have not known or understood ourselves. How to unlock this potential, how to bring forth from the sealed seed of life the opening, the delicate opening of the inner flower, the inner heart, and the recall of past lifetimes, drawing back upon that attainment, those accomplishments, those things which we all want to bring with us. Instinctively, Maria Montessori laid forth a method whereby this can happen in the classroom if we are attentive to her directions. Canada is the one place in the United States where it is understood that Montessori did not bring us a method, but she brought us a message, a message that is a way of life. And for that, I am extremely grateful to the messenger who can give to the world the vision of the true message of Dr. Montessori, I say it's the only hope for the world that we can have a generation of children who are going to establish the golden age all humanity is sighing for. How can it be done only by having the proper environment and the people who understand the role of children in building a new generation? So Camelot is the answer. I have no doubt about it. Summit University is unique. It is an ascended master university. It is a university of the spirit. It is a place to study, to show oneself approved to God, to find one's inner self and to understand what is the real inner meaning of the path of service that leads to reunion with God. We study the teachings of Gautama Buddha. We study the world's great religions. In class, we spend much time on learning the science of the spoken word, which is the dynamic decree. 
It is a time for prayer, for fasting, for retreat. It is a scrubbing of the consciousness from the burdens of the world. It is entering into the interior castle of the heart with one's own Christ self. The Ascended Masters work with us for a 12-week course to bring out our inner self and to allow the soul to be introduced perhaps for the first time in this lifetime to the real self and of course to the I Am Presence. And I think what is so exciting is that all ages, all economic levels, social classes, and in the period of 12 weeks, these people become one, one heart, one great devotion they've gone through, initiations together they've experienced, laying down their human consciousness and discovering the divine, and it becomes a tremendous circle of love. Community is the circle that is protected by its members, the hallowed circle where God educates his children. If we had this teaching today, but we did not have community, it could not survive, and we would not have the opportunity to act en masse and in force to change world conditions. Pythagoras saw this and all of the teachers who founded the mystery schools. The greatest prophet who has ever walked the earth in our time, the prophet Samuel, recognized this. And he came to establish the nation of Israel. Community is the flame of the Holy Spirit, hence it is the flame of love. The love that spans between the guru and the chila, the figure eight flow, contains this entire community and it contains the worldwide community of the unascended chilas of the great white brotherhood just visualize god the great guru and yourself as the chila and the spirit matter cosmos actually hangs on these two points these two extremities of the plus and the minus and then think about us, one upon one, the great love we share for one another because we love God in one another. I am the devotee of the God in your heart. That is the God that I worship. That is the God who is in the earth. So to me, the chila is that point of my ultimate devotion in matter. And that devotion is a very intense fire of love. By that returning current, which becomes an accelerated momentum, the community is actually built. Its foundation, its physical buildings, its publishing, all that it does on a planetary scale is infused with this light and love. It's a perfect attunement and harmony, and it is an indestructible union. It cannot be broken because love has fused it together as one.
Welcome to the Inner Retreat. We begin a bold adventure at our Inner Retreat. It is the mighty work of the ages, and this is the place of our community, the cradle of a new civilization. Here we stand on the promontory of the rock, and there the mighty Yellowstone, the river and the park, and behind us the Royal Teton Retreat, and we are the Royal Teton Ranch, physical focus of an ancient memory. We stand here and we contemplate the flame of our beloved Gautama, and we feel the flow of Shambhala. We look to the valley, the very heart of our retreat, and there we gather for our freedom song each 4th of July, for the victory of the age, for the teachings of the masters. This is the place of great encounters where we encounter the real self, the mighty I am presence, Sanat Kumara, and friends of light who will come through this very valley from all over the world, called by the mighty heart flame of the word itself. We welcome you to the heart and we sing the song of gratitude. Here, O oh universe, I am grateful. strangest places. <laughs> we meet in the heart of the inner retreat. It's a great miracle, but this miracle was wrought by God and man. And you are a part of that wondrous miracle, every single heart flame burning here today. And so, for 24 years, we have been working to build the Summit Lighthouse. Mark Prophet started in 1958. And I don't know, in the farthest reaches as of his outer consciousness, if he saw us here. And yet I wouldn't be surprised that he did because Mark saw many, many things. And I used to see him seeing those things and I'd say, what do you see? And he said, I can't tell you. <laughs> so I know he knew a great deal. And Maury and Mark used to speak to me about the great expansion of this activity. Surely this is a great magnet and focus for the expansion of the light on the earth. And I'm sure you all feel as I feel, a tremendous protection, serenity, and the ability to seal our efforts in the heart of the mountains. It presents a great, great challenge to us. But we are up to that challenge, and the masters are up to that challenge. We get a chance to figure out how to survive, how to build, how to use energy in new forms, testing all the things that we've heard about for the new age. It's a wonderful land. It's a great white piece of paper. I haven't seen all of this property yet. I've gone pretty far on it, walking, hiking, by car, horseback riding. It represents a future that we and those coming after us will have ample room to write upon. We have so much to be grateful for, 
So many beautiful things to talk about. It is so wonderful to see you. You are all welcome to come to that inner retreat. It's just waiting for you. All of your brothers and sisters around the world put together their contributions just so you'd have a place to come to when you needed it. You can come there to work. You can come there to study. You can come there for a retreat and fast. And the next big event we're holding there will be in the summer of 1987, over the 4th of July. So come by the end of June and a couple of weeks into July and you can have a mighty experience camping there with our conference and our dictations. And uh, Richard, are you here again? Oh, good. I'm going to give you my microphone. You can tell these people about your activities here. It's so joyous to see so many of you here and that you've stayed so long. My wife and I are the directors of the group here in London. And I think really to tell you that we do have a study group which has operated here in this city for three to four years. We're gathering strength. And so for many years we'd look forward to being able to do this kind of thing, to put on something so large and to have the messenger with us. We have in our center all of the publications for sale. We have a study group each Tuesday evening. We have the services that Elizabeth Clare Prophet has mentioned to you that we hold weekly. So we are constantly going through a program. We play what are known as the inner workshops, which covers a very wide realm of the teachings. It fits in the pieces to the puzzle. And if you come along, if you would care to come along to learn how to decree, to study the Master's teachings, we will do the best that we can to help you forward with those things. If you would like to join us in decrees, we do have the longer services to decrees, whether the songs played, it's quite a joyful occasion. And in this wise, I would welcome you uh, to our center. Thank you. You know, this, uh, this ranch is like the great American dream. Like it's, it's pioneering the Old West, homesteading, 
having a cattle ranch, having a farm, herding sheep, tending the bees. We have a great uh, restaurant. It's called the Ranch Kitchen, which doesn't show up in this film, but uh, it's become a mecca. People from all over the place come there. And since it's a tourist center with a park, they come from all over the world. But we really do have the best food in Montana, no question about it. People, people stay there just so they can eat. Stay around the area once they discover the restaurant. So it's all run by our people, all organic food, homemade bread. All of our pastries and pies take the prize at the state fairs every year. We always win about a dozen blue ribbons uh, for our baked goods. If the concept of this place is a self-sufficient spiritual community, and it's really a survival community, but it, the concept of it is that full mastery is the God control of your environment, yourself, yourself in your environment, and to not be subject to the control of uh, superpowers and international economists and manipulators of your money and your money in the banks and uh, deciding that if you and your progeny are going to survive you're going to have to get separated out from the systems that control you and get back into the God control of your life. <laughs> You've been watching The Coming Revolution in Higher Consciousness with Elizabeth Clare Prophet. Is the coming revolution in higher consciousness. Listen now to Elizabeth Clare Prophet, educator, author, and authority on the most exciting story of our time, the coming revolution in higher consciousness. It gives me great joy to be with you here this evening in London. I'm very happy to welcome you to my heart and to the heart of the Ascended Masters whom I represent. I come sent by them to deliver to you a message and a transfer of light in this hour of the transition of the ages. In this hour, as we move from the age of Pisces to Aquarius, we have much to reckon with. And we find that the prophecy of what is coming and what we are experiencing in the earth is written in many places. Most of all, as the law of God, it is written in our inward parts, in the subconscious, as well as in the superconscious mind. I would like to read you some words from scripture by way of underscoring the reason why I deliver to you the teachings of the masters of East and West, truly the lost teachings of Jesus Christ. You're all familiar, I am certain, with the words that Jesus spoke, telling his disciples of that which would come to pass in the end of the 2000 year era of his teaching and presence. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, 
and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the one end of heaven to the other. It is the hour of the anticipation of great darkness then, and of the great light of the coming of the Son of God, even into your own temple and life. For truly that universal light is the light that is kindled your own identity and has been the stream of continuous consciousness of your soul's evolution for eons in the heart of Christ. Thus we come to the opening of the seals and the Lamb of God who is that universal Christ opens the seal and John the revelator who received this book from the ascended master Jesus Christ when he was on Patmos says, I heard as it were the noise of thunder one of the four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And so this is the opening of the seal of the four horsemen. I believe that the book of Revelation is the story of the evolution of your soul and mine and of all ages as we confront the great light of the I am that I am who spoke to Moses and as we confront our karma, the darkness we have woven, the not-self, the anti-self we have created, and as we perceive our reality to be that universal light. Therefore, this book is very specific for this end time, but it is also very specific as you walk the path of initiation following the Lord Christ with the saints of heaven. And so we can see in this first one, in the beginning of this century, as this century is the last of this era, the coming of World Wars I and II, we can see the United States and allies going forth, conquering and to conquer, conquering by light. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. We see the sign and symbol in this prophecy of the Soviet Union. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld and lo a black horse and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Here we see the manipulation of energy and the economy, the oil and the wheat. And this manipulation of the goods and of the abundant life is also to the detriment of the people of earth. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death and hell, followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. War and pestilence, plague and famine comes with the fourth horsemen. And we see all these events being outplayed. And somehow there is a relentless force. It is called karma. And the four horsemen are the signs of the returning of personal and planetary karma as we see the interplay of superpowers 
and powers in control of all of the earth and her goods. And we see the karma returning as the last plagues of diseases for which there are as yet no medical cures. In the face of all these things is the coming of the Son of Man, is the coming of the Ascended Masters, those who have gone before us to transfer a light that we might be in the midst of the cross currents of darkness, pillars of fire and keepers of the flame. We fear not prophecy because we know God has given to us prophecy that we might be the arbiters of our destiny, that we might change history and the future by the sacred fire, by calling forth the light of the I am that I am, of the great God and the sun behind the sun, and of our own I am presence. This is like a newscast of the future set forth by Jesus through John, so that we could do something about it, so that we could call forth the violet flame in this seventh age, taught to us by Saint Germain, who also is foretold in this book of Revelation as the coming of the seventh angel. And when he comes, it is written, the mysteries of God should be finished. And when he comes, there is given the little book of the law, sweet in the mouth, how happy we are to hear the law. But when we digest and assimilate this teaching, it is bitter in the belly because it causes the chemicalization, the alchemy, it demands change, it demands acceleration. If we are to survive that which is coming upon the earth, we must have the experience of intensifying the light in our body temples. We must go up and above and beyond those dark things that come out of the depths of the pits of death and hell upon the earth. God has provided a way. He has given to you and to me the individual presence of himself. He has given to us sacred centers of light and a mighty threefold flame in the heart. And so the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains of their karma, fall on us and hide from us the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? God in you shall stand and you shall also stand if you unite with that pillar of fire that is your reality. This is the prophecy of Saint Germain who was the prophet Samuel to the nations. It is a very personal prophecy to the people of Britain because you have been blessed by the coming to this land of Jeremiah the prophet who brought with him the Bethel stone of Jacob which is the stone of scone. You are blessed for he brought with him also the last of the Davidic line of kings, the daughter of the last king under the line of David. And this was the beginning of the royal house of Ireland long ago. It was transferred to Scotland and now to England. We understand then that the reincarnation of this people as souls of light descended from the eleventh son of Jacob, Joseph, with his coat of many colors, signifying the many colors of the great causal body, the many paths of God and his great mastery. He had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim and Manasseh were called half-tribes and blessed by Jacob as his own. The peoples of Great Britain and America are the true seed of this son, Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim and Manasseh then are the descendants. Their descendants have re-embodied here and their actual physical nature of the peoples here is likened after this ancient one. The ten tribes were scattered throughout Europe and some to the far east to India and the two 
The other two tribes were of Judah, and they are the Jews that are still known as the Jews today. So we have ten tribes of individuals who have descended and re-embodied, as it were, in the Gentile nations. Together the twelve tribes then make up the seed of Christ, the seed of the Ancient of Days that was born, souls of light who came through Sanat Kumara and came through Abraham. You have an ancient memory of your fiery destiny, and you have been waiting for the light and the understanding to unlock your seed potential. The members of these tribes have reincarnated in all races and nations by this time because of world karma. Nevertheless, the founding and the focal point of destiny and that migration is here, following the footsteps of Jesus who came with his uncle Joseph of Arimathea, who was a tin merchant and one of authority in that trade, came to Glastonbury as a young child with his uncle after the death of Joseph and with his mother Mary, was here in his early years, studied and was tutored, and there was made available to him through the Druid universities the great wisdom of the time. Thus at the age of 12 he confounded the doctors in the temple. In the latest book I have written on this sequence, I speak of the lost years of Jesus. For it is written in Buddhist texts and manuscripts that were guarded in Himis, in Tibet, in Ladakh, all the way to this century, that Jesus left Palestine about the 14th year. It may be the 17th year according to other documents went to the Far East, spent 17 years there, and returned to Palestine at the age of 30. He was both student and teacher in the Far East. He went to many places, studied the various religions, learned the alchemy and the adeptship of the mother flame and the light of the chakras, brought back all of that ancient wisdom which came down to India from the lost continent of Lemuria, which sank beneath the Pacific, as did Atlantis beneath the Atlantic. Lemuria was the motherland, and all religion has come forth out of the light of the Divine Mother, because it is the Divine Mother who teaches her children how to release the light of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. This power of the Trinity is in your heart as the Divine Spark, and the key to unlocking that spark comes to us through that mother flame. Jesus, it is recorded in these texts, extolled woman and proclaimed her as the highest representation of God, the female principle in each and every one of us. He taught reverence for the mother. He rebuked the power elite in church and state who would take from the people the poor and the lower classes, the real teachings of the Vedas and the ancient scriptures. For this he incurred the wrath of the priests and therefore narrowly escaped death and went on his way. It is a very exciting story and in the book I have written we have the translation for the first time of Abedananda's discovery of the same texts discovered in the latter part of the 19th century by Nicholas Nodovich, the Russian explorer. So there are two sets of texts translated and the corroboration of others who have gone to Himis and who have heard of the legends such as Nicholas Rorick who went and spent many years in that area of the world looking for the records of Jesus and everywhere he found the stories and the beliefs of the people that Jesus had been there. And some even said he was there after his resurrection. And we find corroboration of this possibility in the writings of Irenaeus, the church father, who said Jesus was teaching his disciples for at least 11 years after his resurrection. Irenaeus said this information came to him through John the Beloved. So there are many mysteries that are not written, of which we have not heard, that perhaps have been kept from us. 
The most principle of our understanding is that the light of the Eternal Mother, released through the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, has blessed East and West with the mysteries of the path leading to the return to the One and the Law of the One. We must hasten then our understanding of these principles, for we have nowhere to go if the captains and the kings and the mighty ones call for the mountains to fall upon them in this coming of the great judgment day of the Lord, in this alchemical change of ages, where shall we be found? We must be hid with Christ in God. We must be in the light and of the light, sealed in the light, and one with the angelic hosts. There is a very special blessing that comes to the people of light in this hour, a sealing and a protection. And this is my point of reading to you this text so that we can position ourselves in time on the belt of history vis-a-vis -vis the prophecies. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. These are the cosmic forces of Mu, Four cosmic forces, four planes of the pyramid of matter, the mind, the desire body, the physical body, and the etheric or memory body. The four corners of the earth representing the four sheaths, interpenetrating sheaths of consciousness which comprise the vehicle which your soul is using right now to occupy and master this physical plane. So angels of God holding the balance of these forces stand. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And so the angel, as we call him the Ascended Master, Saint Germain, who is the great hierarch of the Aquarian Age, has sent me to you for this blessing of the sealing of the servants of God in their foreheads. You may know that Saint Germain, following his incarnation as Francis Bacon, the greatest mind and light England has ever produced, attended a mock funeral and went on in full adeptship as the master, calling himself the Count Saint Germain, spent over a hundred years attempting to prevent the French Revolution, its bloodshed, and the calamities that have come upon Europe. His great dream was the United States of Europe, partially fulfilled today in the common market. At that time, although he produced miracle upon miracle, he could heal the flaws in gemstones, he had the appearance of a man of 40 for more than a hundred years, produced an elixir of youth, was seen and witnessed to have changed base metals into gold. In other words, had the full mastery of the physical plane. When he would appear in the court of France, he would be seen to disappear as he was leaving. This Saint Germain then has given to me two instruments for the sealing of your forehead. The one are the mysteries of Christ, the lost teachings of Jesus that belong to you, that are a part of you, that you need in this hour. And two, his presence, whereby he does transmit through me and through an emerald matrix, a physical emerald he has given to me, the sealing of the third eye. Saint Germain then comes this evening to transmit to you that light, that very energy of his causal body, 
The sealing of the servants of God is for your protection through all hours of transition. But the real sealing, as there is the Alpha and the Omega of the sealing, is in the transfer of wisdom and the knowledge which is a sword in hand that can be used. It is a sacred sword. And the word sword is the key to the word sacred word. It is the science of the spoken word and the use of the word in the throat chakra and then in all of the chakras for the release of light in your temple and the increase of the presence of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I'm going to then give you the teaching now, sealing it in your mind, in your forehead. And at the conclusion of the teaching, I'm going to invite you to come forward so that I can place the emerald matrix on your forehead. When this blessing takes place, I am in an altered state of consciousness. The Master Saint Germain uses my chakras and heart to transmit his energy and the concentration of that energy through the emerald. Thus, I should like to begin now the mighty teaching of the ages, which you already know. I teach you nothing new, but only that which you know at inner levels. This is the law of God that is written in your inward parts. And this is the day prophesied by Jeremiah, when every man should sit under his own vine and fig tree. The fig tree is your tree of life, the great causal body, and the vine is that personal Christ. I would like to illustrate this teaching for you now with slides. This is a great sphere of light. Look at it and then close your eyes and visualize it right at the point of the brow and the third eye. You can visualize the eye of God centered at the brow and it is open and you are looking through the eye of God as you would look through a window and you focus and concentrate your attention upon this great sphere of light. This is called the sun behind the sun. You are the sun of man or manifestation. The sun behind you is the great causal body, the causal body of light, the universal light. This is the sun, S-U-N, of God. Malachi said that the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness would come with healing in his wings. It is the point of your higher consciousness, the point of your meditation of the presence of God with you. You must have that point of focus of attention in your daily life. When you raise your attention and raise your sense of God and look on high and behold that spirit of the presence with you, you immediately plug in to the universal light and you can feel yourself flooded with that light, permeated with the presence of comfort. Visualization is very important in the exercise of your seven sacred centers. The whole spirit matter cosmos, all that is in physical manifestation, has a center which we call the great central sun. It is a physical center and a spiritual center. The spiritual center again is called the sun behind the sun. Every manifestation in matter is diagrammed in the same way. You are the physical microcosm. You are a great universe of light. You have atoms and molecules and cells and organs which are your starry system. Your heart chakra or heart center is your central sun in the physical octave. But you have a sun behind that sun that is your real identity. The real you is above and beyond this form and these interpenetrating sheaths that are called in Genesis coats of skins which we wear. So we must come to realize that this is a vehicle but not the totality of self. The soul in the very heart of the Spirit of God is greater than the sum of the parts of manifestation which we see. Now we pursue a path of the mastery of matter and of these bodies, and so we must withdraw for a moment 
to the sun behind the sun and know that this is our native habitation. Every atom in your body has a nucleus and in that nucleus there is a fiery interchange over the figure eight, a flow between spirit and matter. And the greatest miracle of all creation is that we are composed of elements of physicality and matter and yet God can endow and cause to exist within this chalice, this bowl, if you will, a living flame. And that living flame is your divine spark. It is the gift of divinity, of God's consciousness to you. If you did not have that divine spark, you could not begin to know God. You must have something of God in you to be able to relate to the universal divinity. Now beyond that white sphere you see the great causal body and you see that it is composed of spheres within spheres of rainbow light. John the Revelator saw a mighty angel clothed with the sun and he had a rainbow upon his head. It was the living figure of the I Am Presence which is diagrammed in this chart over the altar. When you come to realize that we are in the world of effect and that we came and descended from the plane of cause or first cause, you begin to see that in order to control ourselves and our environment, we must contact the light and draw it down. Why doesn't it automatically come down to us? Because God is a spirit and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Matter and spirit are in polarity. Spirit is the plus polarity and therefore we call father in the masculine term, our father, though he contains the eternal feminine. Matter is mater, the eternal mother. It has a negative polarity. Negative in the sense that it is in polarity with the father. This negative polarity can become misqualified and then we talk about negative vibrations when we really mean negative karma or misqualified energy. So here in the mater universe, we then are confined to that negative polarity until we ourselves realize both plus and minus factors by drawing down the light of the spirit and that light can be contained in these sacred centers and in the whole body. Jesus said, if your eye, which is your third eye, be single, one pointed on God, your whole body would be full of light, filled with the light of God. When you are filled with that light, you are untouchable. The whole negative manifestation that mankind have made of this planet of darkness and death and dying and disease cannot touch you because your atoms and molecules are vibrating with the sun behind the sun. And this is your divine right. We defend human rights all over the world in all kinds of causes and demonstrations, but I am here as the champion of your divine right and your divine light and to show you how to access it and to live and walk in the presence of the immortals, to walk and talk with Jesus as he said he would come to you and with Saint Germain and the holy angels. So this is your body of first cause. Jesus referred to it, he said, in my father's house are many mansions. This sphere of light is pulsating above you right now. It is infinity. It cannot be conceived as time and space. Great spheres of light, and you descended as your soul was created in the central sun through these concentric rings, putting on skeins of consciousness. Where did you think that your integration with life and your understanding of all that you know today came from? It came from the cosmic mind. Your soul did not acquire all that you are in a few weeks and months of development. But you have been forever in God. You came from God, you will return to him, and now is the hour for the ascent of those who have descended from him. Jesus said, no man can ascend to the Father 
saving he who has descended from the Father. And therefore there is an I am race on the earth of the light bearers who came from other systems of worlds with the one whom Daniel knew as the ancient of days. And so you came trailing clouds of glory and you have that I am presence as that seed of light. And now comes the hour of the understanding of this divine presence. I would like to give you the intoning of the universal sound of the Om. It is spelled with three syllables, in this case to emphasize that it is the sounding of the Trinity. In the book of John, John the Beloved, the fourth gospel, we find the great mysticism of Jesus. We find words that come directly out of the Vedas. Did John write this without the authority of Jesus? Nay, they were one, the beloved. John lay his head upon the breast of Jesus. And so John said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And without the Word was not anything made that was made. It is in the ancient scriptures of the ancient of days. This teaching is what Jesus brought back from the East. Yet he knew it within his being as you know it. Sound then is the means of creation. People ask me, what about meditation? What about prayer? All that you have studied of these and other teachings is the path that leads to the point of your focalization in the word. Without the word, the spoken word, you are not yet a co-creator with God, yet you are as his sons and daughters sent forth by Elohim who created you to be co-creators with the infinite one. That is why you have a throat center and the gift of speech. The power of the word in you is more than vocal cords and even more than a spiritual center because the sun behind the sun of you, the universal mind of God, releases the word when you form the vowel sound, when you intone the consonants, there is a vibration and a quivering and you tie into the universal sound and the universal hum of the universe and therefore you become a part of the great cosmic stream of reality. And so it is not that you originate the word, but you allow the word to pass through you because you have free will. The sounding of the Om is the quivering of that vibration in all of the centers, the toning of the chakras, the preparation.